So, uh, Tenakoto Tenakoto Katua, uh, welcome to the second uh, CEF Group Symposium. Uh, it's uh, my great pleasure to uh, uh, welcome you all uh, to this event. Um, it's hybrid. We have uh, 150 people registered. I'm not sure we have 150 people registered here uh, to, at the moment online and, and here, but um, yeah, it's, a, it's great to have you. We've grown in the last year. And I really just want to hand the floor to, to Richard Blakey, who is a, our um, uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and who's been incredibly supportive uh, to the group and other. Uh, climate related themes around the university not surprisingly he's a physicist so physicists sort of get this problem right um, so thank you very much Richard I leave it for you to formally open ah there I am there I am just double checking yep um now the roro naku tararo ko ora ai te iwi um your basket and with my basket, the people will prosper. I purposefully use that whakatauki um, uh, proverb uh, because the challenges we face, uh, we cannot solve alone. In a mana, in a rio, uh, e na iwi o te hoe fa uh, tena koutou, tena koutou, tena koutou katoa. Um, to, the, to the mana that's in the room, the, the prestige that's in the room, to the voices that we'll hear, and to the people from the four winds that have gathered for the symposium, uh, my greetings to you all. Tene, tene uh, ka uh, iraro e te maru ona mana whenua, um, ka te mamoi, waitaha, uh, kaitahu, uh, no mai haramai tauti mai. Um, I stand here under the uh, umbrella of the people of this place, uh, of Otako, of Te Wai Paunamu, the people being uh, Waitaha, Kati Mamoi, and Kaitahu, and uh, I welcome you to this place uh, on their behalf, those that are here in physical presence and those that are here virtually. Welcome, welcome, and thrice welcome. Um, ko Richard Blakey Takawingawa, um, he kai mai hi haha te whariwananga o Otako, a tēnā koutou katoa. My name is Richard Blakey. Thanks, Ivan, for the intro. I'm DVC Research here at the University of Otago, and my job is to uh, actually, in many cases, and I'll do that as soon as I can, get out of the way and let the really good, really good work happen. But for those of you here um, physically who are not members of the university, uh, our manuhiri, our guests, welcome. For those of you virtually who are not members of the university, uh, welcome, welcome, and thrice welcome to you as well. I just want to give you a little bit of an overview of the University of Otago. We're very proud to be um, New Zealand's first university established in 1869. So we're just over 150 years old. For many of you joining from other parts of the world uh, in organizations or universities, you will see us as a university that's just um, getting to a level of maturity beyond our teenage years where we're able to be confident in our of our place in the world and understand what we can do and contribute. Um, we're founded on the Scottish tradition and our four founding professors came here from Scotland uh, to help set up and establish our, ourselves. Um, I will often draw in my own discipline in the physical sciences from our first professor in natural sciences, James Gow Black, who um, was driven and self-motivated uh, to educate himself and educate others in his region of Scotland before uh, gaining uh, a professor professorial position and then being recruited to be the first professor of natural sciences here at, at the University of Otago and here in New Zealand. He was a chemist, uh, but also at that time in the, in the 19th century uh, was in a, a frontier region where extractive industries uh, were the heart blood of the economy here in Otago, where mining and, and extraction was, was critical to the growth and development of this economy. Um, and one of his, he, he would travel out to the mining communities and he would e educate miners on aspects of chemistry and sciences that they needed to improve their work. Um, and in his inaugural lecture here at Otago, he is quoted as saying that one of the purposes of a scientific education is to produce a pound of wool or coal or gold or iron at half its previous expenditure. So he understood very well from that time in an era of extraction, that extractive industries led to economic productivity and value. But it was about expenditure. It was about 
pure economics. And I think we, we would see that James Gow Black today would talk about cost uh, rather than pure expenditure. He would understand that we are in, a, in an era where we need to look at not just the financial and economic cost of our, our activities, but the social and environmental and cost to well-being of the activities. And that uh, in that cost context, whatever we do, whether it is regenerative or circular or extractive, uh, all of which will be needed in our near and, and mid-term future, we should aim to use our collective wisdom and our education of science, of uh, business, of humanities to try and produce and uh, extract or use resources at uh, lower cost and lower expenditure in, in a broader context. So I can see that through this Climate and Energy Finance Group, through the symposia, uh, engaging both within academia and very, very strong engagement that I see both in this room and in the, in the, in the presenters from practitioners and industry members, I, I can see that we have a very important part of our university activity and a very important contribution that we can make to the uh, regional, uh, national and global effort to try and understand ways that we can live uh, more comfortably uh, together and with it, within our resource limitations uh, on this beautiful planet. Um, just for context, and uh, Ivan has identified it briefly, uh, climate and energy finance is a, is a University of Otago research theme that sits uh, within a, a, a nice nexus between uh, sciences, business, uh, humanities, and health, that uh, we have a long-standing history at Otago in energy research. In fact, I was taught by one of the founders of Otago Energy Research and National Energy Research Activities and Professor Jerry Carrington. Um, and our, our Otago Energy Research Center is another jewel in the crown that looks across the broad spectrum of uh, technological, uh, social and, uh, and community needs related to energy. So climate and energy finance is a strong contributor and Ivan was a co-director of our Otago Energy Research Center. But also um, on, on the other side of, of climate now sits as one of a collection of uh, climate related uh, centers. And I could, if, if we were at a face to face meeting, I would have a nice conversation with many of you about the wrangling that we went through to try and understand what is, should our approach be around climate at Otago. Uh, we have a, a number of activities that we do support as themes. We have climate and energy finance. We have an ocean acidification theme and we have a climate and health theme. And we actually went through some uh, back and forth to try and say, why don't we put all of these themes together in one uh, mega Otago uh, climate change uh, center. But it turns out that actually um, across that spectrum, there is value and connection and we do have a connecting element, but there's also significant disparity that retaining some disciplinary focus whilst connecting across the broad theme of climate is the, is the pathway that we've chosen. I believe that's the right pathway, um, but that we provide um, some incentives and some requirements for these um, separate entities not to live in isolation from each other. And so there is an overarching connecting entity called Hei Kaupapa Honona that is the clearinghouse that the themes get together to discuss uh, overlapping issues, but we, we we see climate issues as so pervasive that you can't just have a single point of leadership to deal with everything. So I, um, I look forward to dropping in and out to some of the sessions, uh, but I look forward more to hearing uh, report back from Ivan and colleagues about the successes that you've had uh, during this symposia. I'm incredibly impressed by the, the um, breadth of the, of the presentations that are in your program. Uh, you know, to, Usually when there is a group symposium, you, you would say, actually, this is a couple of people, they're graduate students, and maybe one or two um, friends from a neighboring department or a, another, another university. This is truly global, and I am truly, truly impressed with this. And given the global nature of this, um, I think there's a tradition that you, uh, you end these kind of welcomes with a, uh, a fairly general quote. Um, I would like to end this with a quote from Truman Burbank to just remind ourselves about the times that we live in. 
this unusual time where we're in some kind of inverse Truman show. We're looking through our Zoom screens to the rest of the world rather than uh, the rest of the world looking at us as some artificial, uh, artificial um, uh, landscape. I think it is, these are challenging times, but I think we've got to embrace the challenges and think about these as truly exciting times because what we have in this symposium is one of the advantages of us moving to a, a, a more um, virtually interconnected global community in that a CEF group symposium can connect globally and relatively seamlessly now um, with the, the impetus um, of a, a pandemic that will lead to enduring changes that will reduce our, our the carbon footprint from these activities. But I leave with the Truman Burbank quote that I think should be a universal Zoom greeting for intercontinental, intercontinental um, meetings, because what do I say? Do I say good morning or good evening? I just quote good Truman Burbank and say good morning. And in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. And uh, all the best for the symposium. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, great, great, great to have your words. And uh, for those of you that are not from New Zealand and are online and from abroad, uh, that was a, a Maori welcome at the at the beginning. I should have explained that. Just getting the slides going. And uh, yeah, I'll just say, uh, I'll start by saying a few words um, about Ceph Group and uh, this year. Cool, I'll just grab, grab, grab my cheat sheet. So th thanks again, Richard. Um, so it's hard to believe we were here a year ago um, and uh, a lot has changed. Uh, so we obviously had uh, COP26 uh, this year um, and we seem to have, I thought last year, could there be any more momentum around sustainable finance and climate finance? And we've had a year where that momentum has built again. Uh, I, I sort of wonder at what stage we'll reach uh, a peak uh, sustainable finance uh, interest uh, interest in sustainable finance. Uh, so from this slide, um, these are actually slides I used. Uh, I, I, the Reserve Bank did a presentation or issued a report on uh, climate change uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I was uh, grateful to be invited to, to speak at that. I used this slide, and, and so um, these are signatories of uh, United Nations principles of responsible investing. So these investors uh, claim to take uh, ESG, environmental, social and governance issues into account when they make their investment decisions. Um, and uh, one of the things here is uh, you'll see the figure that, you know, clearly there's, there's a sort of exponential rise in the number of firms. Uh, that are involved in, in ESG investing. And in particular, from our perspective, is the E, uh, the taking the environment into consideration. Um, and so if you look at the numbers, they're, they're truly staggering. So close to over 100 trillion of global assets under management uh, now factor in uh, ESG. Um, so, you know, that seems very positive and, and to uh, echo uh, uh, Richard's comments there that we should be optimistic or, or, or embrace the challenge in a, in a, in a positive way. Uh, and, you know, when you factor in global asset, uh, assets under management are about 120, 130 trillion. It says that most institutional managers, uh, most pension funds now consider ESG factors when they invest. Um, now there's some debate, is this just greenwashing, right? Um, so is, how much substance is there to this? But the, the vast majority of, 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 of investors are now taking ESG or at least the environment into consideration when investing. Uh, but on the other hand, so it's a bit of a paradox. We look at the climate mitigation funding gap. And uh, so I think if we're gonna decarbonize the economy, the investment we need to make is is in the region of, of you know, 3 to 3.8 to 1.6 trillion per year. Uh, so, and currently we're investing around the 600 billion mark. So there's a huge funding gap. So it, it, there's a paradox. There's a lot of asset managers that say we wanna invest in this area, but there isn't 
enough money actually flowing through and why why is that right and I see uh, Sebastian nodding his head so to the physicist you might be wondering yeah why is that that's very perplexing uh you know Sebastian over there and and David uh will probably understand some of the complexities right of, of and there are a lot of complexities there are legal responsibilities that um you know uh, an institutional your pension fund manager can't just go and in, invest in a very in a direct project in, in in a developing country right there's a lot of risks there so there's considerations of fiduciary duty of 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 that sort of uh consideration um so you know there is this paradox there is all this money so actually i i, I think I, I would call it the, the largest market failure uh, the globe has at the moment, right? Because on the one hand, you have all this pent up demand, uh, you, you, you get green bond issuance, and you get huge demand for it. Uh, and on the other hand, we have this funding gap. So, you know, this is what this group is all about, is how can we help plug this, this gap? How can we make sure that that 600 billion become uh, more like 1.6 trillion or so, at least, so that we can uh, stay within, um, uh, you know, two degrees, I think 1.2, 1.5 is looking challenging. And it's also just also beyond climate, right? So there's a whole host of other issues. I think we had the Assembly of Investment Chairs this year, and, and a big issue there is um, how, uh, <clears throat> how, how uh, um, uh, sorry, bi biodiversity finance and, and how we can finance that and, and deal with some related issues. As I said, we, I thought we'd reach peak sustainable finance, peak climate finance, not at all. So one of our speakers uh, later on today is a professor called Jesse Keenan. He's at Tulane in the US, and he wrote this, this article in Science, The Climate Intelligence Arms Race in Financial Markets. Um, so there is just this, yeah, this arms race this, uh, that, it, that is going on. You are... Uh, very interesting stuff going on. So Google collaborating, people using satellites to see to see if um, power plants are on or to measure emissions of, of, of methane. And so, you know, a very exciting space. A lot of startups, you're getting the big data service providers uh, like uh, Moody's and, 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 and Bloomberg investing heavily in this area. You also get the, the big consultancy firms also building up uh, 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 their teams in this area. So that leaves us wondering, well, where do we fit in as business schools? And again, uh, about a week ago, I was uh, very, uh, uh, very honored to be invited to talk to the global business, uh, 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 global business uh, network. Uh, I think the, the Otago is a member of it. Um, GBSN, I, I forget what the acronym is exactly, but uh, and so we, uh, they had a conference called uh, GBSN and Beyond, and uh, one of the, um, I, I hosted this uh, panel on, you know, sustainable finance and investing, but with a focus on where do business schools sit on that, and yeah, I was very honored to be with uh, Ian Culture, uh, Leeds Business School, and Andy Carolyn, who most of the finance people in the room will know, who was editor of the Review of Financial Studies and facilitated the, the very first special issue of an elite journal in this area. And yeah, so there's a real, you know, it's a process real challenge. How, how can business schools respond to this, this issue? Um, how do we change our curriculums, right? Uh, curriculums are already full. So uh, do we need to uh, develop specialized courses or do we need to integrate it into current curricula? Um, so there's real challenges there about research. How do we do research? So finance has historically been a two trick pony, right? So empirical research and some theory. And by theory, we mean mathematical models, usually based on rational expectations. So I wrote a paper around this, um, the fact that top finance journals hadn't really responded to, to climate change uh, uh, in 2017, which uh, generated quite a lot of interest and uh, a lot of support. And, and some people were less than happy with it. But you know, it really challenged that perception that um, maybe if we're gonna do if we're gonna to contribute to this debate, we might need to do things differently rather than just the old way. Climate change, uh, biodiversity, uh, they're forward-looking problems. Yes, they're happening now, but there's only, you know, looking at the past can only help us so much, right? So we need to be brave. We need to go and embrace other disciplines. We need to engage, engage with industry if we really are gonna be relevant. And all those themes came out in this panel discussion, 
right? But it's not easy, and not many universities, are, I, I think, are leading in the space. Uh, which takes us to Ceph Group. Um, so really, Ceph Group started in 2017 um, when uh, we um, uh, were, well, actually, the Global Research Alliance for Sustainable Finance was set up in 2017. That was headed out of Oxford. Um, and so in response, we were invited because two of our PhDs were, were, were hired by Oxford and we were invited to join uh, uh, Grasfi. And as a response, we set up Ceph Group and it also reflected the growing interest in this area. So Ceph Group now has around 22 researchers. So, so 19 of them are our Otago faculty. We now have our first two uh, postdocs uh, and Quinn there is our first uh, ex ever externally funded postdoc, I think in the department. Um, and so, you know, we have 19 Otago researchers. We have people like Greg Seiss from industry. We have uh, collaborators from GNS Science and Gudeka Scientific. And here's our, our very good looking team, uh, apart from the, the guy on the far right. Yeah. So, you know, really, and, and, and the other thing is it really important for this team is, you know, we want to contribute to, 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 to uh, this debate in New Zealand, but not just in, the, in New Zealand. We see that we have a regional role, role to play in Asia and Australasia. So we're one of only four universities in the Grasby Alliance uh, that are, that are, that, that are, uh, that are in, uh, in Grasby. Um, one, only four universities, sorry, that are in the Asia region. Um, and one of my roles as a, as a Grasby director is to try and increase the number of, of Asian uh, and Australasian universities in Grasby. Because actually the, the, the battle to mitigate climate change is probably ultimately going to be largely won in Asia, right? Because that's where we've seen huge demand. That's where most uh, or, uh, uh, coal is implemented. So you look at the team and it reflects that, that Asian feel. You know, it's an Asian century and it's an Asian research grouping. And as I said, our, 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 our focus is, yes, we do the empirical stuff. Yes, we embrace traditional theory type type research, but we need to be brave. We need to go and talk to the physicists. We need to go and talk to the um, uh, hydrogeologists at GNS Science, even if it can be a pain in the backside, okay? Um, so the other thing is, so uh, when I talked about uh, uh, GBSN and beyond the, that network of business schools, um, one of the conversations was around teaching, okay? So what do we do? What's the strategy? Do we create new courses? new programs or do we integrate into existing ones? Well, uh, at Ceph Group, our strategy is we do both, right? I think we need both. Um, so every finance and accounting graduate should know something about climate change, something about sustainability, but not everyone will be a deep specialist. To understand climate risk, as we'll see today, and, and this is one of the things with the symposium, is we want to embrace people doing cutting edge research and using cutting edge methodologies, actually involves gaining skills from different disciplines and across uh, different areas. So, so we have this dual strategy. We want to integrate it into our existing programs, but we're also increasing our offering. So we've had a, a longstanding accounting course on sustainability reporting. Um, We've also had my course now, I think it's run three or four years in climate and energy finance that feeds into our, um, feeds into our uh, masters of finance. But this year, uh, Sebastian established uh, Think 399, which is sustainable investing. Uh, and that's for our undergraduate students. And we hope, uh, it's not like there's a, a huge audience and this is being recording, but we hope that that will also feed into a, a minor. So we're working into creating that into a, a minor in, in sustainable finance. And also, um, and so we, we had, how many students did we have that in the first year? Sorry? 26, and we didn't really get a chance to, to advertise it, right? Apart from posters on the lifts, right? Uh, uh, of Sebastian up a tree. I don't know how, why he was up a tree. He never fell off the tree though, okay? Uh, <laughs> I don't think it was a it was a it was a tilt at, at possum. So those of you that know what possum is, uh, <laughs> it's an animal, but it's also a drinking game. Our, our students are famous for. But it, anyhow, uh, Sebastian sparked attention. But we had twenty six students, and we didn't advertise that. So I, I get a sense that there is demand. And talking around the Grasby network, um, I know, for instance, uh, 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 Singapore Management University have entered a deal with Imperial, where they're going to be doing their masters teaching their masters out of Singapore. And that's partly because Imperial's room in London was full. They couldn't 
fill any more students. So there's demand. And also Quinn, uh, hopefully uh, in 2022, uh, will be introducing advanced modeling climate financial risks, again, to our master's students. And I think that's gonna be a unique uh, course um, that will use some of those sort of forward-looking uh, skills that we need to do, for instance, TCFD uh, reporting and so on. So, so she's been working hard on that, that, that uh, course outline. And, and uh, we hope there's plenty of students signing up to that. But you know, one of the things there is we need students that know finance and have some, some sort of coding skills, right? So, so yeah, it may take a some time to, to build that up. Uh, speaking of Quinn, and so uh, this year we started on our first large uh, uh, funded project. So from the Royal Society, the Strand Marsden Fund project, uh, looking at risks uh, to residential property. Um, and uh, so this is, again, a very exciting collaboration. So uh, Quinn is the principal modeler and, and uh, the postdoc on this, uh, but we also have GNS Science, Pudeka Scientific. Um, uh, the Reserve Bank is a partner in this. So one of the ideas is to take, well, you know, the flooding that's happening to houses and aggregate that up to uh, the bank risk exposure because 60% of New Zealand banks banks balance sheet uh, is tied to domestic real estate and most of us live close to the coast so it's potentially a financial stability risk. Um, we've uh, figured out that uh, all the uh, permutations that we want to look at means that we need to use some sort of supercomputing. So we've had incredible support from, from Nessie and I'm glad Richard is in the room. They're, they're an amazing bunch of people. And so we're learning how to use the, 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 the supercomputer. Again, I think it's the first time it's been done in the finance department. Um, and also we've got a great partnership with CoreLogic who have basically uh, given us access to their whole real estate uh, uh, database for the whole of New Zealand. And um, so really exciting project, we're getting started. It's very interdisciplinary, it's not easy. Uh, um, and, you know, we all speak slightly different languages, uh, but uh, yeah, a very exciting project. Also this year, uh, we entered into a commercialization agreement uh, uh, following a paper that uh, came out of Quinn's PhD, uh, looking at uh, using car uh, machine learning to predict carbon footprints. And so EMI is a really exciting firm based out of Australia, uh, backed by some serious venture capital, uh, trying to create climate risk metrics on, on the transition side. And, and we're gonna hear some of the work that we're doing together with them uh, in, in, the coming, uh, in, in the coming day, uh, today or tomorrow. Uh, finally, um, or uh, uh, we had the third assembly of investment chairs last week. So Sebastian did all the hard work on that. Um, I basically step aside, uh, but, uh, and this is really an event focused on practitioners and in particular, chairs of, of investment committees. Um, and yeah, we had Brent Robertson there, so the Deputy Prime Minister, and I understand the event went uh, really well. So, so we have two main events. We have the assembly and, and we have this symposium. And this symposium is really uh, informal, right? Uh, so Kiwis are famous for their informality. It really is about uh, getting input on your, on your work. So we have um, nine keynotes, uh, a panel discussion, uh, which I'm really looking forward to hosting. Um, and we have 22 papers across seven themes. Today is more around the big picture and, and policy type uh, issues um, and you know, innovative methodologies. And uh, tomorrow is more around more traditional type empirical uh, work. Uh, and really uh, that leads me to, to thank uh, Steph who's done a huge amount of organization in the background and actually has allowed Ceph Group, uh, so that's our other postdoc, um, so the Ceph Group strategic postdoc has allowed us to, to, to go from, from, yeah, I mean to the next level if you look at all the work she's done on our, on our website and also supported us on uh, several research projects. So so welcome, I enjoy the day, it's informal, okay? There's no deputy prime minister here today. Uh, we just wanna have fun. We wanna celebrate the end of a tough and long year, uh, but a, a successful year, I think. And uh, yeah, we want to advance this knowledge, uh, not because we wanna publish papers and journals, because we wanna improve the world and, and tackle this problem. 